We are live, I think. We're live for round two? We're round two, I think so. Okay. Well, hey, um, friends, I had the chance yesterday to give a sermon on the subject of heaven. So we were finishing our series on the prophet Elijah, and if you're familiar with the story or you were here yesterday, 2 Kings chapter 2 recounts Elijah's um, surprising end. And surprising because it's not normative for somebody to just disappear, not die and go to heaven. Um, Elijah's one of two people in the scriptures that did that. Enoch, you can read about him in uh, Genesis chapter 5. His story is also recounted in the sort of Hall of Fame of Faith in Hebrews chapter 11. Um, so he doesn't die, goes straight to heaven. Um, and then we also have Elijah that gets carried into heaven in this uh, with horses and a chariot of fire. So um, yesterday we spent some time exploring what heaven will be like. And at least our best guess and best sort of um, synopsis from scripture. And in the bulletin, I said, hey, if you have any questions about heaven that I didn't answer um, in a sermon, which there's a lot of questions people have about heaven, I'm sure, that weren't answered yesterday, but offered to just short, shoot a short little video today to answer some of those questions. So um, that's what we're going to do today. Would love for you if you're uh, live with us or um, one on. Yeah. Okay, cool. Um, for you to post some questions, we have people send them in also, and so uh, I'm going to take a stab at answering some of those. But um, Aaron's going to read those to me so um, I can answer them. So Aaron, can I link this to my site too, or to my? Um, yeah, you should Facebook be able to also. find it, the live feed. Oh, and yeah, and then just share it? Yeah, just share it away. All right, share now. Posted. Boom. All right. Cool. You want to send me some, give me some of these questions? Yes. All right, question number one. And this is from Kenneth Smith. Um, how should we interpret chapters 7, 8, and 9 in Ecclesiastes, which have which has verses which seem to say that death is the end of life? Yeah, that's a great question. Um, so I think what Ken's probably referring to is at various points in the Old Testament, the authors seem to suggest that there's nothing after life, um, uh, this life here on earth. E Ecclesiastes, if you go to the book of Ecclesiastes, there's a number of, of areas, a number of places where the author seems to suggest that. Now, let me just read one of them to you, um, and I think that it'll be helpful for us for a springboard. Um, he says this, anyone, verse 4 of chapter 9, anyone who's among the living has hope. Even a live dog is better than a dead lion. How do you like that metaphor? For the living know that they will die, but the dead know nothing. They have no further reward, and even their name is forgotten. So what he's saying, is, he, he's in a dark spot. If you've ever read the book of Ecclesiastes, there's a number of times where he just gets to this spot where he laments that he was born, where he says life is futile. And he's in this spot where he's saying things that he feels deeply, but I don't know that we should necessarily build theological foundations off of everything that's said. So I think there's better passages for us to look at the afterlife from than the book of Ecclesiastes. And then we have to read Ecclesiastes through the lens of what those passages would say. So if you were with us during worship yesterday and um, Aaron read a passage from Job chapter 19. And in that passage, Job chapter 19, verses 25 through 27, Job says... Um, I know that my Redeemer lives, and I know that after I die, I will stand on this earth, me, not someone else, but, the, but really me, and in my flesh, I will see God. So even in the Old Testament, we have these hints and shadows of a hope of resurrection, but those hints and shadows are fulfilled in the person and work of Jesus, ultimately. So Jesus is said in 1 Corinthians chapter 15 to be the first fruits of those who have fallen asleep, that those who have died, that he's been raised from the dead, 
and that those by, who by faith enter into life with him will also be raised from the dead. They'll be like him. So our best information that we have about the afterlife or what comes after this life is through the resurrection of Jesus, that the ultimate end for those who by faith have stepped into life with Jesus will be the resurrection of their physical bodies. So um, now just a clarification, if you're with us yesterday, I talked about the two phases in heaven. Um, the first phase is heaven or temporary heaven where people are now absent from the body, but present with the Lord. That's 2 Corinthians chapter 5, verse 8. But that the ultimate end of those who follow Jesus, the ultimate end of every person, actually, is resurrection. Some to eternal life and others to what the Bible would say is eternal death. So resurrection is the ultimate hope. Heaven is not the ultimate hope. Does that make sense, Aaron? Yeah. Okay. I think that's helpful. All right, cool. Cool. Um, if people have questions, you can also... Uh, come in, comment below, and we'll, if we can field them, if we have time, we will try. We'll do our best. All right. Do our best. Second question, same uh, same person. What is Sheol slash the grave? Some Bible translations show one and some use the other. Yeah, so um, typically the word Sheol um, is translated um, either it's left as Sheol because it's a unique idea. It's a Hebrew word. Um, or it's translated the place of the grave or the place of the dead. And it's all the same word in the Hebrew. In the Greek, that same word is translated Hades. Okay, so this might get a little bit complex. If you want a better, more complete sort of unpacking of this idea, you can hop online and listen to a teaching we did in a series that's called Four Days That Changed the World, where we talk about Jesus' descent into the dead or descent into hell. Um, so here's my best understanding of what we do with this word Sheol. Sheol, before the ascension of Jesus, was the place that both the righteous and the unrighteous went after death. It was essentially um, the place of the dead. That's a great translation. Um, a holding tank for those after they've died. And it had two compartments. Um, one compartment was for the righteous. And it's called, sometimes it's called paradise. Sometimes it's called Abraham's bosom. And then it had the compartment or the place for the unrighteous, typically just referred to as Sheol or Hades. Now, when Christ resurrected from the dead and then ascended to heaven, Hebrews or Ephesians chapter 4 says, he led a captive of hosts on high. Like, essentially, he populated heaven with his ascension, taking captives with him. So others joined Elijah and others in heaven at that point in time. Now, it was um, the place of the dead, or Sheol, is still the place where those who die, apart from Christ, go. So Sheol is populated right now. Heaven is populated right now. The righteous part of Sheol is empty because those people are now in heaven. So both people in heaven and people in Sheol await resurrection. One, a resurrection to life, new heaven, new earth, and one, resurrection to death, or what the Bible would call um, hell. So that's, that's what Sheol is. <laughs> pretty, pretty, uh, it's, it's, it's pretty complicated in the scriptures, but, um, all that information's there and I'd encourage you to go and, and to, to seek it out. Yeah. Yeah. Do you, uh, we'll try and I'll try and post in the comments a sermon that Ryan addressed that a little bit more in depth too. Um, yeah. I'll post that in the comments if I can find it. All right. Third question in this section is no see in heaven. Revelation 21.1. 1. 21.1, yep. Uh, especially after my travel this summer to South uh, Sudan, or no, South Pasadena, I don't know, Florida? I don't know what I'm... Florida. Florida. Yeah, Florida. <laughs> uh, anyway, and you live in um, Ensenada, California, and being San Diego, California. Okay, yes. I think I know what he's asking. Yeah, yeah, so what's the deal with there being no sea in heaven? Um I'm a California guy, I was born and raised, raised in Orange County for 12 years, went back and lived in Escondido for five years, 
Um, I read Revelation chapter 21, verse 1. There's no sea in heaven. And um, maybe like you, I start to think, is it heaven if there's no beach? Um, I don't know that it is, to be quite honest with you. And luckily for you and I, um, I don't think that the author, or that John, uh, the author of Revelation, is talking about a literal physical ocean. So here's where understanding a Hebrew mind and mentality would be is pretty helpful. Because the Hebrew people were typically pretty afraid of the ocean. Um, they considered it to be a chaotic and unordered space, okay? So it was a, a the place where chaos reigned. Even in the creation narrative in Genesis 1 and 2, you can see that the ocean is this sort of unordered um, space where anything goes. So a few stories start to come to mind if that's the case. Um, number one, when the Hebrew people, when the Israelites are freed from slavery out of Egypt, what do they cross through? But they cross through the Red Sea, right? The sea is parted for them to come out of chaos in Egypt and into the promised land. Um, when the Israelites get ready to finally go into the promised land, what's happened? Well, the, the river, the water is parted um, and they walk through on dry ground. Um, one of the miracles that Jesus does to display his authority over nature is he quiets the raging sea. Now, for a Hebrew mind, all of these are sort of hints and shadows of God speaking into the chaos and bringing order out of chaos, which is exactly what he does in Genesis chapter 1 and 2. Now, as you read through Revelation, what you'll see is the beast or the dragon sort of comes out of the sea, comes out of chaos. It symbolizes evil. It symbolizes chaos. It symbolizes non-God space and comes onto the scene. Um, and so I think what's happening in Revelation chapter 21 verse 1 is not that God's saying that there will be no ocean. I think that's one of God's most beautiful, vast creations. I, I love the ocean. Um, it's one of the places I feel closest to God. Uh, I don't think he's saying that there will be no literal physical ocean. I think what John is actually saying is that there will be no chaos, there will be no evil, there will be no, no unordered space in heaven. Um, so I think, I think that's actually, it's, it's actually a, a metaphor, it's a, it's a Hebrew idiom that he's building on and saying that's not, not going to exist in heaven. So I, I think that's what's going on there. Does that make sense, Aaron? I think so. <laughs> I'm sort of half in and out looking for comments and stuff. Usually. Okay, cool. But, um, yeah, Brenna, I really want to know if the physical ailments of the earth are eliminated in heaven. Oh, that's phase a... one. So heaven, temporary heaven, yeah. current heaven are physical ailments, uh, relieved in heaven. Um, I would say absolutely 100% yes. And one of the best texts that you can go to on this is Revelation chapter 6, verses 9 through 11. And here's what it says there, and this is my synopsis, but what it says in Revelation chapter 6, 9 through 11, is that those people that had been martyred for their faith, the people that have been martyred for their faith, that they are, um, they're crying out in heaven for justice but they're, they're able to cry out. They're, they're restored. And it says that they're both souls in Revelation chapter 6. And, or Yeah, verse, verse 9. And it says in verse 11 that they get a white robe. And so we have this sort of convergence of two ideas. One, that they're, they're not quite physical bodies like yours and mine yet. They will be at the resurrection. Not yet. Um, that they're not quite physical bodies, they're, they're called souls, but that they are given a white robe. So there's some sort of physicality, some sort of um, material. We're not exactly sure what it is or what it looks like, but here's what we do know, that those people that lost their lives were made whole, that they were able to cry out to God and to cry out for their blood to be avenged here on earth. 
So there's a number of things we find out about heaven in Revelation chapter 6. Things like, it seems like people in heaven can see what's happening on earth. People in heaven have questions. They can ask God questions. Um, people in heaven don't get all the answers to their questions, even in heaven, which is a little bit frustrating. Um, people in heaven are learning. People in heaven are growing. People in heaven are changing. Um, these are all some of the things that I, I think make heaven uh, worth anticipating and hoping for because there are things that about our humanity that we cherish and love to a great extent. Um, but they are healed and they are restored. And one day their physical bodies will be restored when Jesus comes back and we have the resurrection of the dead. But in temporary heaven, they're restored and healed also. Awesome. Um, we had a question that was coming in about hell. It's funny, you give a message about heaven and everybody wants to talk about hell. Can I get, can I get on my soapbox for just a second about while you find hell? that question? Sure. Yeah. What's interesting, if you read through the scriptures, is that heaven and hell, in, in most of our sort of Western evangelical commentary, are, are offset. Um, like when we talk about heaven, we also talk about hell. But in the scriptures, um, heaven has a counterpart, but it's not hell. It's, it's actually earth. In, in the beginning, God created the heavens and the earth. And those two places were essentially overlapping um, in the beginning. And sin fractured them so that earth space, human space, and God space were no longer overlapping. Um, they were disconnected. So life, life was separated from the giver of life. Now, we have these places in the Old Testament where um, God's space and human space overlaps. Um, we have in the temple, that, that's what takes place there. Um, and now as believers, we have the spirit that dwells in us. God's space and human space essentially overlaps in the human body, which is sort of mind-blowing. Um, but the story is all about um, God's space and human space being disconnected. And what, what God is up to in the world is reuniting heaven and earth. You read the beginning, Genesis 1 and 2, that heaven and earth are united. God's space and human space is essentially the same thing. God walks with Adam and Eve. Um, and in Revelation chapter 21 and 22, the end of the story is God's space and human space reunited also. Um, and so I said yesterday that really what God's doing is he's getting the hell out of earth. Um, he's taking the evil, the destruction, the death, the violence out of earth so that he can restore his good creation, heaven and earth reunited. The dwelling of God is with his people and they with their God. Okay, so what's the question about hell? Well, <laughs> she said she was, gonna, she was writing it in right now, but let me ask. Okay. I thought it was coming in. Drum roll about. So, but yeah, you can, people can ask their questions on here if they have any more. Yeah, um, if they're, we'll stay on for just a few more minutes, and then after that, we'll, uh, we'll call it good. But if you have any questions, afterlife, heaven, hell, welcome to the other side. Thank you, Adele. Yeah, send them in. All right. Oh, she's typing. Oh, it's on Facebook. Oh, okay. okay. Maybe it's there and I just wasn't seeing it. I think she just posted it on our... Oh, I wonder if she posted it on your Facebook. Uh, you want me to check? Let's check. All right, here, I'll check. Ah. Okay, here we go. Um, you brought some clarity on what heaven would look like for Christians. Do you think there are large misconceptions about hell that could be clarified as well. Um, I think there are a number of misconceptions about hell. Um, it's interesting, most of the time when you hear people talk about hell, um, they talk about it in an evangelistic sense. And, and here's what I mean by that. When people talk about hell, they're like, well, you, don't, you really don't wanna go there, so you should trust Jesus. Um, what's interesting is that Jesus never talked about hell like that. Like he talked about, if you read through the Sermon on the Mount, he talked about the, the hell of, of anger. He talked about the hell of hate that eats away at the human soul. And he's talking to disciples, to believers, 
So at least in that instance, it's not necessarily a place that they go. It's a reality that they're living in now. Okay, so that's one way the scriptures talk about hell, and I think we um, get that wrong. Um, I don't think there's um, any passages, maybe Luke 13, maybe, maybe, but I don't think there are any passages that actually use hell in, in an evangelistic sense. Here's what I mean, where Jesus talks to somebody who's not a disciple or a Pharisee about hell. There's not one place, which is fascinating. Um, if we want to build sort of a theology around whether or not that's a place uh, we don't want to go to. Okay. Um, other misconceptions about hell. Well, I think one of them is that there's people there now. I, I, don't, there aren't, I don't think biblically there are people that are there now. I think it's a place that's prepared for the devil and his angels. Um, and right now, the unrighteous are in a place called Sheol, awaiting judgment, which will happen at the resurrection. Both the righteous and the unrighteous will be judged. The righteous will go to everlasting life, new heaven, new earth, new creation. And the unrighteous will go to hell, um, where they will receive eternal punishment, which is death, for sin. So it's essentially a way of saying, like, there's no, there are no second chances in this that, um, that that's the place where death reigns and death rules for all time. Revelation paints this picture of the eternal torment of, of hell sort of rising in this smoke for all of eternity. It's this way to say, like, there, there's no going back from this. There's no reversal. Um, yeah, I don't know. Those are a few of my you thoughts about one. hell. Yeah. Come on here. So if someone doesn't find Jesus in this life, is that it for them? Yeah, so the scriptures would say really clearly that um, we are appointed to live, um, to live once and to die and to then face judgment. Now, um, here's what Dallas Willard used to say. Uh, Dallas Willard used to say that God will let anybody into heaven who can possibly stand it. So the question is, are we becoming the kinds of people that will enjoy the presence of God, who will enjoy his holiness, who will enjoy his justice, who will enjoy honesty and the light of his glory shining on us. Um, and so here's what we do know. We do know that God is just, that God is merciful. I don't think the Bible gives an extremely clear answer as to what happens to those who have, for example, never heard the name of Jesus. Um, but what we do know is that every single person faces judgment um, and that we'll have to give an account for the way that we lived our life before a righteous, holy God. Um, that's, that's part of the reality of, of being human. Well, I think that's all the questions that we have on right now. Um, maybe you can, you can all tune in after this goes, um, it'll, it'll still be on the site, but let us know if this was helpful, if this was a helpful medium to get some questions answered and stuff. So, yeah, thanks for tuning in. You, you guys, I'm, uh, grateful for it. And, uh, one of my goals in, in preaching on heaven was to, uh, build at least in my soul and hopefully in yours too, some anticipation of what it is, uh, that, awaits us as as followers of the of the way of Jesus of lovers of the way of Jesus where we get where we eventually will be in a place where his way is the way and where his kingdom fully comes um, and doesn't have any competition from evil or death or the enemy and um, ultimately, that's what new heaven, new earth, new creation, resurrection is all about. So I hope your um, imagination is stirred with hope for that place. So thanks for tuning in, you guys. All right, we're going to shut it down here. Shut her down.